Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. It has really been a minute and today I just wanted to talk a little bit about what's been going on in my life and as the title kind of suggests, uh, this bit of a journey that I've been on over the last few months. So just a really quick update about what I'm doing right now. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were all brought back to the hospitals to continue our rotations after almost three months off. Reassuringly, they told us that none of the resident physicians at any of the hospitals that we would be working at have contracted COVID because of working with patients in the hospital. So we are back and over the last few weeks, I've been on my neurology rotation. Neurology is really cool. Um, it's honestly thrown everything in for a loop. I'm always confused about what it is that I wanna do. So much of neurology is about figuring out what's going on with a patient. You know, someone will come in with a weird constellation of symptoms and you gotta kind of piece it together in a way that makes sense. One of the residents that I have put it to me, neurology is all about tempo and localization. How fast did their constellation of symptoms come on and where do those symptoms point to? Whether it's in the brain, in the spinal cord, in your nerves, or in your muscles. Trying to put all of these things together has really been training me as a historian and as someone who does physical exams because every patient is like a new clinical puzzle, trying to get to know them and their story uh, and to understand how everything fits together. The realm of possibilities is so wide when someone comes in and it's a really marvelous feeling to figure out what's going on, especially if there is a treatment that's readily available. That being said, there are a lot of patients who suffer really bad strokes or who have irreversible dementia who are really sick and have really difficult recoveries and lives after they leave the hospital. So it can also be a very emotionally taxing and, and draining specialty as well. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about this lung collapse that I had just about two months ago now. I was at home, I, I think I was very, very lucky to be at home. I was just lying in bed, sitting there studying. All of a sudden I just had this really sharp, intense knife-like pain just stabbed into my back right under my scapula. It just jolted me. I, I stood up. Every time I tried to breathe in or out, it was just horrendously painful. And you know, as medical students, we learn about something and then we think, ooh, like, is that something that I just learned? Is this some rare condition? And chest pain is just one of those things that we are drilled over and over and over again. Is it something that needs to be taken care of immediately? And I remember telling my mom, you know, I think I need to go to the emergency room. She had just come up trying to call me down for dinner and I was pacing my room because I really just couldn't breathe and it was just such a, uh, honestly a terrifying feeling. And I was really fortunate. My, my parents were able to get in a car and drive me to the hospital. I, I was talking to the nurse and she was asking me these screening questions and I asking me, you know, for everyone, do, do you have shortness of breath? And I said, Yes, absolutely. I've, I'm really short of breath and I feel like I can't breathe. I think I may have collapsed my lung. And the second I said that, you know, they they listened and it was a really reassuring feeling. They immediately rolled over a wheelchair. They brought me a pulse oximeter and my, my oxygen level was around 85%. They got me an x-ray and they took a picture of my lung and you know, your lung is normally the size of your rib cage and my lung had been shrunk into about the size of a fist. So, I mean, your lung is kind of like a balloon sitting inside of a box. And when your lung collapses, what happens is there's a little leak in that balloon, that's your lung and air starts leaking out. And it's a one-way leak. So this box now fills up with air and pushes the balloon smaller and smaller. And so that's what was happening to my lung. It had basically leaked out so much air that it was not able to expand all the way anymore. And that was causing this really sharp, intense pain that I had every time I was trying to breathe in. In the emergency room, they put in a chest tube and hooked it up to a vacuum to suck out some of that air and help re-expand my lung. They brought a thoracic surgeon who came and talked to me and I ended up needing a pleurodesis where they go in, they cut out the part of the lung that was weak and was leaking air. Uh, it's just a really tiny piece just at the top of the lung, like the size of a little caterpillar. And they throw in a bunch of talc powder and that causes an immune reaction that basically sticks your lung to your rib cage so that if it leaks air again, the balloon is kind of taped to the box so it can't really fall and air can't really get in there. I went back, I got the surgery. You know, I, I feel really grateful that I already had a thoracic surgery rotation specifically where 
I kind of knew what the surgery was gonna look like. I'd been on a bunch of surgeries that were very similar. You know, one of the things I was really worried about was anesthesia. You know, what's it like to be put under? It's a very scary, vulnerable place to be. And I think seeing so many anesthesiologists very safely put patients under, wake patients up and time it perfectly for the length of the surgery really reassured me and, and um, made the experience a lot less stressful. I remember getting um, you know, the propofol and the benzos injected into me and it was just a matter of 10 seconds and I just felt this deep sleep wafting over me. And I think the whole experience really just was a moment of reflection. You know, here I am learning how to care for patients and all of a sudden, here I am, I am the patient and I'm going through this whole experience, but realizing how different it is now that I'm in medical school, it just became really apparent that there are a lot of aspects of my journey and about my care that helped me, that made me feel reassured that made me feel like I was in good hands. Whether it's that when I said I couldn't breathe, the nurses listened to me right away, or that I knew how to advocate for myself, that I had an understanding of medical lingo and I could understand what physicians were gonna do to me, that I had good health insurance, that I was at home and I had my parents to drive me to the hospital, that I had a hospital really close to where I lived. All of these little things that are just circumstantial really change the way that a patient experiences their care. Care. And I would just encourage all of you out there, all of my fellow healthcare professionals and future colleagues, that the next time you're working with a patient, what is it that is preventing them from receiving the care that you would want when you are the patient? I just had an example of this on neurology last week where we had a patient on the stroke service who didn't have any health insurance and so much of stroke care is as much what we do in the hospital as it is what happens after they leave. Making sure that they're taking their medication, that they're coming to their regular checkups. And this patient didn't have health insurance and he didn't have a primary care provider, which meant that we couldn't be sure that any of this really important preventative stuff was going to happen reliably. And so much of my job was to make sure that he could get health insurance, to find him health insurance and to connect him with a provider that could quarterback his care. And thankfully we were able to do that. When he left, I think, you know, he felt really appreciative that we were able to do this for him. And I think um, he was able to trust the healthcare system a little bit more and, and was in a place where he was ready to engage. I just really challenge all of you out there to think beyond the physiology, the diagnosis, the management, all of which is so important. Um, but to go beyond that and to also think about the factors that a patient comes with as they enter the hospital and the factors that they're going to leave with when all of us go home at the end of the day. So with that, thanks for watching my TED Talk today. I mean, it's been a really incredible experience learning both on the wards and as a patient myself. And also linked in the description below, I'm going to put an initiative that one of my classmates has been working on. Um, it discusses this very issue exactly about being a healthcare provider and a patient and all the things that we can learn and how we can relate to patients in a more authentic and vulnerable way. Please do go check it out. If you like the video, be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, I'm going to be cooking with some of my buddies this weekend, so I'm going to have a bit more of a vlog style video coming out. Appreciate all of you. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.